Hello everyone and welcome to my uh, first lecture in the Applied for Materials Engineering course. Uh, this lecture is really more philosophical than most of the other lectures that you're going to hear in the course because I thought this subject of applied AI was really new enough to really exp take some time to explain why we have this course in the first place and what makes uh, applied artificial intelligence different from other kinds of computational modeling or other uses of statistics within material science and further going all the way through why we developed this course and kind of what were my rationale around uh, building it. So I'd like to start off first by defining what I mean by artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence itself is actually a very broad term and it can describe many different kinds of software that are mimic human behavior. Uh, these can include things like text-to-speech you could refer to as artificial intelligence around this. Uh, you can refer to your calendar as artificial intelligence um, with some uh, degree of accuracy. But really what I think sets apart the modern descriptions of AI uh, and particularly of the kind that are used in materials engineering are a class of artificial intelligence tools called machine learning. So machine learning is a class of AI that comprises of uh, computer algorithms that are designed to improve based on experience. You will also note that the slide has the term deep learning on it, which I figure we'll go through now just since we're already talking about some definitions. In deep learning, I just prefer the definition of it as a class of machine learning algorithms that use multi-layer neural networks in order to learn from experience and the really particular part about it that makes deep learning models so powerful is they're able to learn very complex patterns from data in contrast to conventional machine learning. And that'll be something that will hopefully illustrate for you hands-on uh, during the length of this course. So as I mentioned, uh, machine learning is a a fairly common class of AI algorithms that learn from experience. Now specifically why you uh, want to create a machine learning algorithm is to be able to learn a program that's more complex than you would be able to do manually. Typical software development involves encoding a lot of mathematics and logic into software that are able to express the real rules describing a system in a way that's put in there, kind of hand-tooled by humans. Now, while this is evidently the benefit, uh, uh, very, very impactful, the fact that I'm able to record uh, this lecture to begin with stands to the hallmark of conventional um, uh, computer programming. Machine learning software makes it possible to write programs that would be too complex to be able to write manually. That is trying to capture rules that are just very difficult for humans to be able to describe. And of these many different classes of machine learning algorithms, the kind that you've probably already had some experience with before this class are the supervised learning algorithms, where these take experience as uh, pairs of the inputs and the outputs to some unknown process or unknown program and try to reconstruct what that process is, given only those input and output examples. And there are many different ways you can do this. Uh, one of the most common, and probably one of the ones that you're already familiar with, are linear regression algorithms, where you have a very simple linear model form. Uh, there are also decision trees, where you define a uh, process as a series of binary decision rules. And there are many different ways of learning these trees within machine learning. And then finally, and uh, still not complete of all the different kinds of machine learning, there are neural networks. And these are really able to learn some astoundingly complex functions. Uh, for instance, um, the application that I think was the most surprising when I originally made this uh, particular slide in 2016 was um, neural networks being able to defeat kind of expert human players at the game of Go, a game which is just astoundingly complex and without machine learning 
uh, uh, kind of knowledgeable experts on the game weren't expecting humans to be able to uh, be beaten by machines for still a few decades to come. So a really fascinating um, example of really the power of machine learning, yet one that's already closing in on five years old. One of the ways I also want to frame machine learning is comparing it to the other kinds of computational tools that uh, one uses in materials engineering. And one area that's particularly close to machine learning are semi-empirical models, where the idea is you, as a human, compose a series of equations that capture the physics of a problem. Say, it could be a diffusion equation where you know that based on the way that this um, uh, say scale on a material grows, it's limited by the reactions at the interface. That interface area never changes, therefore the reaction rate never changes and the growth must be linear. And really the only way that uh, that model isn't directly based on the physics is that there exists some fitting parameters within that model, such as the growth rate that you have to, have to actually learn from data. And these models are typically very simple since they're derived from physical rules. Many of the uh, terms in the models are already defined by what we know about a problem. And you can understand how that model works, when it should fail, by understanding the physics that went into expressing that model form and, le and less so the data that was used to uh, parameterize that model. Now machine learning on the other hand actually follows a very similar problem where you as a human define a model form that you want to learn like a linear model or a decision tree or a neural network and then you provide training data to that algorithm uh, which gives you a model that you can then just like this here semi-empirical model uh, evaluate many times in order to solve a problem. Now these models can tend to be much more complex than the physics-based one if I look at uh, another example, it's comparable to this Tershoff potential, which is used for modeling materials like silicon at the atomic scale. The Gaussian approximation potential has only three, has 300 parameters, an order of magnitude more. And this is actually a very simple model compared to the kinds that we find in the literature. And really these models um, must be understood less from the physics that um, was used to create that model form, but how that physics inter are, and the training data interact with the model form to produce a model that you can use. So it really comes down to less of an understanding of physics, that's the key, and more being able to understand the algorithm and how that works with the data that you provide it. Another common tool that um, kind of looks a lot like machine learning are conventional empirical models. Now the example I give here, here on the top left isn't very important, but it's a very kind of common type of model you might see across the sciences, where there's some physical parameter um, in a very simple model form, and we fit the parameters of it to understand what is going on in the underlying physics. So here, uh, they're describing the amount of martensite in a material or when, uh, at which temperature it forms. And you can see that um, carbon and nitrogen kind of by uh, weight have a stronger effect on affecting this melting temperature. And that can give me some way of understanding what is actually controlling uh, the formation of the structure in a material. The thing about these typical kinds of physics models you see is that they're also, just like the computational uh, models, relatively simple. They're fit to data. We can use that to understand physics. Now, there are many different kinds of ways of doing the same kind of study where I have data and I want to produce a model that, upon inspection, lets me understand more about the underlying physics. But the real benefit of AI algorithms is that they make it possible to delegate more of the creativity of coming up with that model form to the computer at the expense of making it more difficult. This example I'm showing here shows two descriptors for um, defining which 
materials are going to be metallic or non-metallic. And by studying the uh, model form expression, uh, Ouyang and co-workers figured out that one of these actually has to do a lot with compressibility. So it took a bit more inspection and that thought on being able to extract the physics was pushed later down the process, but it gives another tool with more complicated uh, algorithms to be able to really understand what's going on in physical systems. So at this point, uh, hopefully you're getting an idea why these AI classes, um, or, or why we've developed this AI class to begin with. And that really is that it requires a slightly different approach than what we use in conventional uh, data-driven modeling or other kinds of computational tools where being able to understand what is going on in the algorithm is key for success. Now, some of the other uh, things you have to really keep in the forefront uh, of your brain when using uh, AI tools is that these complex algorithms yield complex models that must be used with care. And one real classic example of this is shown by uh, this chart on the top right, where a neural network model trained to classify images can be easily persuaded or tricked into making false predictions by adding very carefully generated noise to the model. And this here is a type of behavior of machine learning models that you don't see with many other kinds of conventional modeling tools. If you imagine I had been a human attempting to encode these rules on my own, I would have not come up with anything um, that is particular to this pattern of pixels being related to uh, causing a prediction to be a given instead of a panda. Uh, the other parts of why I think this AI in materials really deserves its own class is that we don't yet understand all of the ways that we can use AI with materials engineering and it requires using tools that aren't commonly taught. So I really wanted to provide um, students like yourself with an ability to use those uh, tools in an educational way to be able to start coming up with those new different ways we can use AI. So as I mentioned, um, AI can generate some complex models, which as we talked about in the uh, comparison to conventional statistics, means you uh, really are at a hard time to understand why a machine learning model has made particular particular uh, predictions or not. And this really means that you have to be trained to understand how to identify when a machine learning model could have problematic behavior. And I think a great example of this is a paper from Bryce Meredith and others back in uh, 2018, where they showed if I have a set of data that has unique clusters within it, uh, the example that is shown in this figure here are showing that of all of the data of superconducting transition temperatures, uh, there tends to be many different pockets of kind of similar types of materials that have been studied. For example, uh, cuprate semiconductors uh, form their own special pocket of types of machine learn or sorry uh, types of superconducting materials and if you were to train a model and evaluate it in a way that doesn't take this clustering into account you can come up with predictions of model or sorry predictions of the model's performance that are much more optimistic uh, than you might actually see in practice another uh, kind of kind of real uh, tangible picture of where this kind of importance of validation comes into play uh, is work uh, done on self-driving automobiles back in the 90s. This was an example that I learned from one of the textbooks I was reading where it talked about a AI algorithm developer who trained a neural network model to help him detect when he was in a roadway and when he was not, or actually more specifically, detecting where a road was in an image. And he found that it was working very well while driving around the streets of Pittsburgh, except when he came up to a bridge, and at that point the algorithm suggested uh, the road was immediately off to a sharp right. 
Now, upon later inspection of this model, they found that really what was happening was that it was identifying the bands of green on the side of the roadway of grass that in order to define where the road was, which of course only works when you're on a roadway surrounded by turf, not on bridges. And this kind of thing happens in materials uh, rather frequently as well. In fact, uh, this picture at the bottom shows a material my colleagues and I tried to make into a metallic glass because our machine learning model predicted it, but we found that it um, solidified as a crystal and cracked uh, when we cooled it. And you can see that crack in the micrograph and the speckle pattern from all the uh, crystallization. And what we ended up learning later was we used a different machine than all of the other kinds of experiments that we used to train the machine learning model. So while this material we later found actually could be formed in a metallic glass, uh, but it was only with a different kind of machine than the one we employed. So hopefully these little vignettes into why machine learning validation is so important and really how it requires some careful thought about uh, what sort of data you trained on, and what sort of machine learning model is used to learn on that data can be very important and it's something indeed that we're going to give you a lot of experience with in the course. So that cautionary method inside. One of the other things I want to encourage in this class is really the idea that we haven't yet come up with all of the uses of AI that are going to be useful in science. When I started out as a PhD student only about eight years ago, the way that I thought of machine learning being useful was purely in that supervised learning. I can learn a quick approximation to some complicated materials behavior like predicting which material would form a metallic class and that was the way that I envisioned machine learning. But as I've learned more and read more of these uh, new papers coming out lately, there are really many different ways that uh, we can use machine learning that go beyond that kind of simple given inputs predict outputs. There are natural language processing techniques that can assist humans in reading the scientific literature, tools to be able to generate new materials or suggest how we should fabricate them, uh, or ways that we can take conventional or conventional characterization methods and make them even more accurate. Uh, the example on the bottom right shows work from some colleagues at Argonne that could take tomography data and be able to remove artifacts uh, from it using a neural network. And this makes it possible to get high quality images without um, requiring as long of a time for the sample to be under irradiation, which is actually really beneficial for a soft material set to grade under radiation. So with that said, there are really kind of three points that I want you guys to walk away with of this first lecture and carry with you through the rest of the course. Uh, the first of which is to be creative about uses of AI because certainly only a fraction of the ways we could use it have been discovered. And it really takes a clever individual identifying a real problem uh, to be able to come up with those new kinds of models. But of course, machine learning, as I've hopefully convinced you, is something that you need to be very skeptical about. Really think about the kind of training data that you're using, how the algorithm is using that data, in order to be able to understand when you're making predictions or uses of that tool that could be useful or not. And the final point, is I'm hoping to teach you through our practical exercises to be methodical. There are a lot of tools that can help you do your research in ways that are uh, reproducible, such as using Jupyter or some uh, other notebook tools to be able to record your notes along with the actual computation, and tools like Git that can work well with machine learning software to help you effectively keep a, a, a very detailed lab notebook about how you arrived at certain results. The way that I'm going to try to uh, teach these subjects is really to highlight kind of four real practical skills that you need to be able to learn. 
uh, such as how to identify which kinds of problems are solvable with AI, uh, ways for identifying which tools you can use without having to be able to need to implement a lot of algorithms yourselves, and then to do that research in a way that you can communicate it to others and perform it in a way that others can reproduce and extend later. And over the course of teaching you all these practical skills, I'm hoping to build the knowledge in, uh, into each of you on being able to identify what kind of data would you need to solve a problem? How do I take that data and process it in a way that makes it accessible to different machine learning algorithms? And finally, give you a vocabulary of different ways to go about uh, validating machine learning models. And we're going to do that over a course of the next 10 weeks through many different application areas with materials, science, and machine learning to hopefully really give that skill set, which will let you use it in many different areas. So that wraps it up for today, and I'll talk to you all on Friday. Bye, everyone.